Um, one of one of Junior's guys that does most of his piano and organ work um, actually taught, gave Elena a few lessons, and um, I was telling him, I said, "You ought to hear that young lady play." I said, "She is just, she is just incredible." And uh, of course, that made him happy, but. Uh, I appreciate her so much. Turn to Philippians chapter 1 and find verse 21. Thank you for allowing uh, Larry to come this morning. I, I found out that, that Shuri wasn't with him and that makes it a little tough when you're missing somebody like that. So uh, I appreciate him coming. We... Uh, Thank you for your prayers. We uh, we sung this morning and uh, uh, at a homecoming. We had a wonderful service. I tell you, um, really, really good service. Um, there was shouting in the house, and I've not saw shouting in the house in a while. And uh, uh, I gave a, an altar call at the end. We had goodness gracious, there must have been a dozen people on the altar. So we had a <clears throat> it's a real good morning. And uh, thank you so much for. Allowing us to get away every now and then. Philippians 1, verse 21. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I what not. For I am in a strait betwixt two having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. I use this text sometimes at funerals, memorial services, because part of the subject of this text is death. That's only part of it. There's also a lot of life in this text. But part of it has to do with death. And I've told people for years, one of the most ironic statements ever made in Scripture is when the Apostle Paul said, it is better advantageous. It's to my benefit to die. Because we don't normally think of death being to our advantage. Oh, I know there are times that we see someone suffering and they've laid on a bed of affliction and uh, even as close family, we're ready to just give, give them up. I'll never forget several years ago, I had a lady come to me and she was so distraught. I mean, it was genuine. You could see the brokenness in her. She said, she said, Ronnie, she said, I have this horrible feeling. And she said, I don't think it's right. And I said, well, what is it? And she said, I found myself the other evening by the bedside of my mom praying that the Lord would just take her home. And she said, can't be right. And I sought to comfort her by reminding her that 
I could almost guarantee she's not the first that's ever prayed a prayer like that. Because as much as we want to retain and keep those whom we love with us, sometimes watching them suffer and the agony etched in their face and the fact that all of the medical people tell us unless there is divine intervention this person is not going to make it they're not going to get any better it's only going to get worse it's at those times more than just that sweet lady have said Lord I'm ready to give my loved one to you. Now, this passage, as I said a moment ago, is it's about more than just death because it's also about life. And the Apostle Paul is at a juncture in his life in which he's just pulled in different directions. It, 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 it's almost like the old-fashioned tug-of-war that you've seen people play. And that seems to be where he is. Death is pulling, but life is pulling. And he's stuck right in the middle. So let's visit this tonight. I, I chose to title the message, Ready for Heaven, but Needed on Earth. To me, that, that captures this text Paul makes no bones about it. I'm ready for heaven. I'm ready. But he also acknowledges I'm needed here on earth. And I'm going to be honest with you tonight. I think, I think that same thing can be said for all children of God. We're ready for heaven but we're needed here. I began with what I call Paul's dilemma. Tough. His dilemma. You ever been caught in one of those? Sure you have. You feel there's no easy way out. Because if you go one way, there are possible repercussions that are not good. But if you go the other way, there are also repercussions. So no matter which way you go, it's not good. That's the dilemma that Paul faced. In verse 23, he spoke of being in a strait, an S-T-R-A-I-T, a strait. Obviously, you can tell from the, from the spelling, it's not a stretch of blacktop that you're looking down and it's just straight as an arrow. Not that straight, no. No. It's a completely different word. It conjures up a lot of different images, but the one, interestingly enough, that seems to stand out is the fact that it's almost a prison word. And here was a man who spent a lot of time in prison. And when he talked about being in a strait, part 
of his strait was his prison, his earthly prison. That was part of it. Make no doubt about it. And we'll talk more about that in the second point. But the image is of someone who is a prisoner. Paul considered himself a prisoner. He considered himself being held captive in this world. Now I'm going to be honest with you, several years ago that would not have meant as much to me as it does now. What Paul is saying here has meaning for me now that it didn't have 10 or 15 years ago. I find myself more and more and more feeling so out of place in this world. And if you hold values like I hold and I believe most of you do, and you watch the world unfolding in front of you, you do as I said the other evening. You look back and you just go, what? You, you, you live in this, this world which is so shaped by political correctness. And you find yourself on the guard all the time. You don't know what to say. Y'all feel that way sometimes. You don't know what to say. You meet other races or, 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 or other peoples and you don't know how to refer to them because you're afraid you're going to offend them. And then there's the fact that it's getting more and more and more difficult to relate to people that find themselves in age categories different than us. And some of us who are old try to be cool sometimes and, and talk like the kids. And, 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 and guys, it don't work. You know what they do? They laugh at us. They just laugh at us. I'm finding out the best thing in the world to do is just be yourself. Most of the time, they really get a kick out of that. They really do. But if you try to come into their territory and use their jarnigan or whatever, it don't work. I understand to a degree what the Apostle Paul felt. Just out of place. Just out of place. And when the songwriter many, many, many years ago talked about being a pilgrim in this world and a stranger, first times I heard that song, I didn't relate to it. I do now. I do. Because the world is so much different than it was. And, and everything in our world today is not inherently bad. There are some wonderful things in our world and there's things that we enjoy and technologies and all these things. That's okay. Those aren't the things that upset me. It was the things I was talking about earlier where we have to walk around on pins and needles all the time because we don't know how to relate to people. Because the world has changed. We haven't changed. The world has changed. When Paul said, I am in a strait, you picture him chained. Literally chained to a big old Roman soldier. Because for Paul to escape, he would have had to have taken that soldier with him. 
And that soldier's job was to be alert and to stay awake so that would never happen. Never. His dilemma. You feel that way sometimes? You're not by yourself. Second. The second thing we notice is desire. Paul had a desire. In fact, that very word is used in verse 23. He said he had a desire to depart. Go to another city? Go on another missionary trip? No. Die. Literally. Leave this world. I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Paul has a twofold longing. These are things he's yearning for. One of them is liberty. Freedom. Freedom. That would have been easy, as I said a moment ago, that would have been easy for him to feel that way as he was chained to that big guard. Paul spent many years in missionary work. Traveled a lot of miles. But he spent a lot of time, a whole lot of time, in prisons, locked up. Do you know that much of Paul's writings, these letters, whether they be to churches or, or people, were written from prison cells where he was chained up in bondage. A difficult job. Getting a job in most churches. Because on his resume, when asked, have you ever had any run-ins with the law? He would have said, yeah, several times. Have you ever been incarcerated? Uh, several times. Most churches would have taken that resume and they would have thrown them in the garbage. Yet for the Apostle Paul, that was not a badge of defeat. That was a badge of courage. All those imprisonments were because he had faithfully preached the Word of God and stood for Christ. That's the reason he was thrown into prison. But Paul was not only a prisoner in a jail cell, but he was a prisoner to his own flesh. His own flesh. And both of them hindered him. It held him back. If you've ever watched the running of one of the major horse races, you see them. And that jockey's job is to keep that animal, high-spirited animal, to keep that animal in control until that gate drops and it bursts forth. But when they pan that camera around, you can see that animal. And they burst forth from that gate because they're longing for liberty, freedom. That's what Paul was looking for. Free. Not only from a cell, but free from his flesh. 
But there's something else he longed for, and I think it's even more important. He not only longed for liberty, he longed for the Lord. Yeah. He sums it up by saying it's his desire to depart and to be with Christ. It's my feeling that that is the desire of every child of God. To depart and to be with Christ. It's not about just departing. The only thing that does is get us out of the world. Paul moved it several steps forward. He said, I want to depart and be with Christ. With Christ. Funeral I had last week, one of them. I told, and this lady, I've known her for years. And I mentioned in the funeral, she has two children who are living. She loves both of those children very much. And they have done a good job of taking care of her after finding out she had cancer. But I told them in the memorial service, I said, as much as she loved those two children and grandchildren, there was a big part of her died several years ago when she lost one of her sons. And even though she loved both of those surviving children so much, and I know that she showered that with them, there was a part of her died that day that perhaps only a mother could understand, really. I remember when they called me. He died very suddenly. I mean, it was like, you know, one day he's working and the next day he's gone. One of those. And they called me and told me about it. Wanted me to do the memorial service. And I went to see his mother. And it's hard to describe the agony that I saw etched in her face. And she made that statement that I've heard so many times. Ronnie, I don't understand this. You're not supposed to outlive your children. And she was so broken. And I told them in the memorial service, there was such a big part of her died that day. And I don't think she ever got over it. She really, life went on, she moved on, did the best she could. She never get over it. Never. Never. All of us have someone or maybe even more that we have missed so much. Mom, dad, son, daughter, husband, wife. And it broke our heart. It broke our heart. But we took them out somewhere and we said some words over them. And we left that place as broken as we were. But they had their faith in Christ. Just like we have our faith in Christ. And we knew that we would see them again. And that somehow made it okay. And we've held on to that. 
We still hold on to it today. We're going to see Him again. And when we get home, when we get to heaven, what a wonderful blessing to be able to see them. Will we know Him? Why, sure. Why wouldn't we? If, if a man who is in Hades, Hades at that time, if a man who was in Hades could somehow look across an abyss and see someone who was in Father Abraham's bosom and say, send Lazarus. That meant he knew Lazarus. He recognized him. Now that's changed after Calvary. But how can we not know each other? We'll know as we are known. How can we not know each other in heaven? Now your husband that went on before you, he's not going to be your husband when you get to heaven. Your wife, not going to be your wife. But you'll know him. And here's the amazing thing about heaven. Is we'll know him, but somebody we've never seen before. Millions of miles around the earth. We'll know them. Yeah, we'll know them. And our relationship with them will be just what it was with that person that we know on this earth. Because you see, heaven's all about relationships. It really is. And it's all good. It's all good. Paul said, that's well and good. I'm looking forward to see those who I remember who were parts of the church. The church in Philippi, the church in Colossae, the, the, the church in Thessalonica. I'm looking forward to seeing them again. That's going to be so good. But he said, I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ. He said, that's far better. The one that we're going to search out and look for first, first, will be the one who made it possible for us to be there. He longed for liberty. He longed for the Lord. So we've seen Paul's dilemma. Not a good one. He's in a strait. He's being pulled. He's spoken of his desire. The final thing is his debt. In verses 24 through 26, we see the flip side of Paul's coin. He was tired from his labors. He longed to be free, liberated from his prison, both literal and figurative. But that great apostle realized that he had an obligation to those who were still here. They see, here's where we miss the boat sometimes. I say we, maybe I should just say I. I get feeling sorry for myself sometimes and I just want, I just want out of here. I just want to go to heaven and be with Christ. I can follow that with, I'm right there with Paul. I, I just have a desire to go home and be with Christ, which is far better. But I sometimes forget that I have an obligation here. And when I say here, I'm not talking about just Beck Mountain Church. I'm talking about the same obligation that we all share. 
because there's a lost and dying world around us. And we come in contact with them virtually every day. And Paul considered himself a debtor to those people. He wanted to go to heaven. But he knew he was needed right there. When Paul said for you, I have a desire to go and be with Christ, but for you, it's better that I'm here. That almost sounds like some egotistical person who's struck on themselves and saying, you need me. No. That was the farthest thing from his heart. Besides his great intelligence, one of the traits that stands forward so much for the Apostle Paul was his humility and his meekness. No, Paul was not being arrogant. He was just stating a fact. He loved these people so much. And he knew that they had been subjected to teachers who came through because he had seen it in all the other places. There were always those charlatans who would come through and, and, and lie to the church. They would work their way into the congregation. And they would lead people astray. And the apostle knew that he needed to be there for this church and for the others. Folks, that's not arrogancy. No. It's a statement of fact. Here's how that relates to us. I said a moment ago, all around us, lost, unsaved people, they need to hear the gospel. Some of them may stumble onto it watching a TV preacher. Praise the Lord if that happens. Wonderful. Some of them may pick up a Gideon Bible. Probably not too many places you can find one now. They've pretty much destroyed them. They might find them a Gideon Bible and read it. But you know how most of them will be changed? Word of mouth. Through me? Yeah. But also through you. Paul wasn't looking for just an easy way out of his dilemma. No. He knew that he had a debt. And the debt was to a lost and dying world. See, that's, that's what made his straight even more difficult. Because he felt the pull of heaven, but also the pull of the earth. That pretty much sums it up where we are today. Pretty much does. We're ready for heaven. I hope and pray you are tonight. I hope and pray everybody in the auditorium is ready. That if the Lord Jesus Christ were to call you home through death or through the rapture, that you would go. You can lay your head down on your pillow tonight and say, I'm ready. Even so, come Lord Jesus. But even though we can say that with assurance and have peace in our heart, we have an obligation here. Here. I said a moment ago, sometimes people just stumble up on the gospel. As long as the Holy Spirit of God is working, salvation is possible for anyone. 
But if I ask for raised hands tonight, and I won't, the large majority, large majority of the people that are converted in this sanctuary tonight were led to the Lord Jesus Christ by someone else, by another person. Well, no doubt, well up in the 90s as far as percents are concerned of the people that are saved were led to Christ by someone else. A preacher, a parent, co-worker, sibling, someone led you to Christ. That's why it's so impendent on us to be that someone for someone else. Yeah. Paul felt it was a debt. And it was one that he determined to do his best to pay. And he did. To his dying day. I hope you feel that way tonight. Let's bow our heads together. Let me just ask you this, just before we're dismissed. Do you know beyond the shadow of a doubt, and I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Do you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that if the Lord called you home this evening, that you would answer that call because you put your trust in Jesus? You know in your heart that you're ready to meet Christ. Do you know that? Could you just lift up your hand with me? Oh, that's all over the building. Praise God for that. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. If you couldn't, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I just want you to think about this. If you couldn't raise your hand that you know that you're saved, would you find someone even this night and reach out to that person and say, I don't know what it means to be saved. Would you talk with me? Would you pray with me? I'm going to offer myself to you tonight. If you'd like to talk with me, even at the close of this service, I'd love to talk with you. Love to. Christian, we have a debt. We have a debt. Someone shared Christ with us. That's what's required of us in the life of somebody else. Let's stand.